Okay, so welcome Nikki to the podcast. How are things? I'm great. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for inviting me on. No, thank you. I've been, uh, I've been meaning to reach out. I know people may say this a lot, but I've been meaning to reach out for a long time um, because I followed you and I know, uh, I know your work and I thought it'd be really great to have a chat. So for those people that may not be familiar with you or your work, would you like to just start with a little bit of, of your background and, and what you do now in sort of clinical practice and with your business? Yeah, sure. So um, I, like many um, NTs, I didn't uh, do this uh, as, a, as a main job. I worked in corporate for many years um, and then I had a couple of kids and then I went, tried to go back to corporate after, you know, with, with two young children. And, and I was by that stage, I was in my early 40s. And um, I literally, I just, I don't know what happened. Well, I hit 40 and I just couldn't do it anymore. I, it was exhausting. I was kind of walking through treacle every day. Uh, I had brain fog, I was really grumpy and snappy. You know, I mean, life was just pretty much, you know, just getting through the day. And I wasn't really enjoying my children or my job and wasn't being a very good mum or wife or colleague or anything, to be honest. And it wasn't, I had no idea what was going on with me. I just thought, well, it must be just stress or having kids or whatever, because quite a few of my friends were kind of going through similar stuff. And I, um, I went to my doctor and I said, look, I'm, you know, I'm, really horrible I don't like this person I've come and I had my 10 minutes with the doctor and it was in you know close to tears and the doctor just you know typing away and, it, and gave me a prescription and it said Prozac on it which was but 10 years ago was the antidepressant of the day and I looked at it and said I'm, that's an antidepressant I'm not depressed and he said no 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 that's you know it'll make you feel better and I, and after that I was pretty depressed because I was thinking <laughs> is, this, is this it you know is this it anyway am I depressed? Do I need to take this? I, but I knew deep down it wasn't that. So, um, you know, luckily for me, I have uh, a dad who is a, um, G well, he trained as a GP, but he ended up curing himself of chronic fatigue syndrome in his forties and then turned away from the kind of standard drug treatments and went toward more towards the naturopathic model, um, natural solutions, lifestyle supplement, all that stuff supplements and at the time I didn't really understand what he did because you know what, what, he, what came out of his mouth was a bit like well no idea what you're talking about because at that time I had no idea and he said to me uh well you know you don't need that it's your hormones and I said well, what do you mean it's my hormones I'm 42 what are you talking about because yeah you're perimenopausal and at that stage 10 years ago no one was talking about perimenopause I didn't I'd never heard that term before I obviously had heard of the menopause um, but I thought that happened in your fifties and he was talking to me and I was 42 and I still had a regular cycle. And I was like, I just had two kids. What are you talking about? And he goes, well, yeah, it starts, it can start around 35. And I'm like looking at him going, I have no idea what you're saying. I don't know <laughs> what this is. And you're saying it's my, so obviously I was quite skeptical, but he said, I'm going to show you what I mean. I'll get you tested. And we did all these various hormone tests and I was blown away. I was like, I had four or five different hormone imbalances and I had no idea what was happening. And once he kind of explained it to me, it made a lot of sense, but we not, we're not taught this stuff in school. We don't, as women, we go through, you know, puberty and then pregnancy and we don't really know what's happening to our hormones and our bodies. We kind of know the overview, but by the time we get to 40, we don't know what's going on. And obviously there's so much more information around now than there was 10 years ago. And I was lucky that I had my, my dad to kind of sort me out, but he said to me, you know, are you looking after your hormones? I said, I don't even know what, how to do that. So uh, he said, well, you need to be eating right and these kind of nutrients and these sorts of supplements and you need to be managing your stress because that's really important. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm not doing any of that stuff. In fact, I'm doing the opposite of all of that. So um, I took notice of what he'd said, especially when I'd seen the results of the tests and uh, started to change a few things and it wasn't major but it was a few little tweaks here and there and started taking some supplements and honestly within a few weeks I felt so much better and I thought this is incredible the brain fog lifted the energy came back my mood started to balance and I just thought well there's something in this and I just just started doing more and more research and I just got fascinated by hormones and what they do and we how underestimated they are and I just thought I've got to learn more about this so I jacked in the corporate career and made the momentous decision of going back to college to study nutrition and hormones. So, and that was uh, six years ago I graduated. So uh, yeah, I've now been in the last six years helping many women in similar situations, uh, educating, hopefully motivating them, inspiring them and giving them lots and lots of tools to manage their symptoms naturally 
as, as naturally as possible. It's not always possible, but mm -hmm. you know, when we do the very basics and we look after our hormones, they, they tend to reward us. So it's, uh, it's, it's important, especially for your future health as well. So it, it's a double win. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think, um, stressing the importance of the basics and how powerful they can be is, um, is an important message these days because I think we can underestimate the significance that our busyness or our stress levels or our dietary patterns, etc., have on all systems within the body, including and especially the hormonal system. So, I mean, we mentioned off air how we view both of ourselves as kind of the bigger picture people these days. Um, are there, and you've you've semi-answered this obviously, but are there some common themes, some common topics or elements of lifestyle that you see clinically that are common contributors to imbalances within our hormones? Oh, absolutely. So I, um, I've, I've kind of put them into four different categories to make it easier to explain. The first one is obviously your diet. So I call these four things that, you know, your big hormone disruptors. So the first one is dietary. So, you know, we've got to get away from kind of looking at food as you know, calories and um, good and bad, if you like. But there are, you know, um, food is, is information. It's it gives a message to your body and to your hormones every single time you eat something so or drink something. So if we know those, the, the foods that are going to support our hormones and, and switch on all the good things that, that our hormones do for us, then you know we can make those choices. Um, so the disruptors for me, obviously things like sugar and refined carbs, they massively disrupt, disrupt your hormones because they have a direct impact on insulin. So insulin is a real um, smasher of your hormones, if you like, it, it, <laughs> it's gonna help. Uh, all those blood sugar dips and, sur and surges um, obviously create more insulin and, and insulin has a, can have an inflammatory effect on the body and it can increase estrogen, so it can imbalance your estrogen and progesterone. Um, and obviously, you know, your body's in stress mode if, you, if you're on that blood sugar roller coaster. So the, the, the sugars and the refined carbs are a big one. Um, the bad fats as well are really not helpful. The vegetable oil type fats and the trans fats, which you get in processed foods and, um, you know, anything deep fried. Um, they turn up in everything these days, don't they? And they, and they can masquerade as sort of healthy, healthy for you as well, you know, polyunsaturated fats. But no, no, we really don't want to be loading our bodies full of that we want nice stable natural fats as much as possible because that's what your hormones are made from and that's what they you know we we need ourselves need to then um, receive the hormones and make them work for us so it's really important that we don't um, eat or we avoid uh, too many of those bad fats and then you know things like alcohol and the usual things you know are, are tend, can tend to be hormone disrupting um so that's the first one the second one stress you can't get away with anything now stress impacts absolutely everything and it has a direct impact on your hormones so when you're when you're in a stress fight or flight situation which we tend to be in most of the time i love dr chatterjee's uh, reference to these micro stresses i don't know if you've read his book but um the stress solution and he talks about these you know we're, in the old days when we were you know, attacked by lions or um, we had these big stresses to deal with and dangers um they were macro stresses and they were life-threatening but these days we've got these little micro stresses and you know they happen from the minute your alarm goes off in the morning to getting your kids ready and for school and you getting out in your car and there's a traffic jam or the train's late this constant barrage of these micro stresses and they build up and up and the body has the same reaction as it would being attacked by a lion so we have this fight or flight response but in the old days we could run off to our caves and recover and, the, and switch off that response. But these days, obviously, it's kind of harder to do that. So we don't get as much off time. So we've got a lot of cortisol running around and adrenaline. And the cortisol especially has a, quite a suppressive effect on that, the rest of our hormones. So that can hugely affect things like your thyroid, which, which runs your whole body. Um, it can affect your estrogen and progesterone as well. And obviously, um, it can mess with your blood sugar too and, and mess with your sleep and energy and mood, your weight, all sorts of things. So when you're constantly stressed, and, and what I found in clinic, which is really interesting, is the people, the women that come to us with the most severe symptoms are generally the ones with the most stress in their life or have gone through the most stresses. It's, it somehow has this direct, I mean, I haven't done a study on it to be fair, but just anecdotally, 
it seems that you know stress just goes along with a worse menopause um, and I think you know I'm sure you would agree with that if, from the people you've seen but um, with other practitioners as well they've all said similar things so big one stress and it's not just lifestyle type busyness as well stress can cover all kinds of other things as well that you not, might not even be aware of so internal stresses like toxins or you know um, food sensitivities or infection uh, can all be a stress on the body and raise cortisol but you, and you may not be even be aware of it um, but that just puts extra extra stress on the body and and can impact your other systems mm. so that was number two number three <laughs> hormone disruptor i can go on though <laughs> is for me is the environment because this is the one actually um many women aren't that uh, clued up on because they kind of know what they should be eating they know that stress is, can, can have an impact they know they need to exercise and when i talk about this one this is the environmental impact it's not that well known about so uh, but it's important that we're all aware of it because we have a huge amount of chemicals in the air around us um, in the foods we eat the water we drink the the products we use and quite a big chunk of them are endocrine disrupting chemicals EDCs they're called and there's a ton of research on these things and I've split them down into three big ones that I think most people should be aware about and the first one obviously is BPA and plastic one of the major endocrine disruptors so endocrine obviously is your hormone system um, BPA is, is you can think of it like a fake estrogen so it can latch onto your estrogen receptors and act like estrogen so we really don't want that happening <laughs> So, um, you know, BPA and plastics and it's things like uh, food containers, water bottles, things like that. And the worst thing that we can do is heat these things because then the BPA can leach through into the water or the food. So putting plastic in the oven or microwave is possibly the worst thing for that. Um, or, you know, drinking a bottle of water that's been sat in a hot car or something like that. So that, those are things to avoid. Pesticides for me as well are really important to try and limit as much as possible. You know, we can't limit them all the time, but... You know, trying to eat organic where possible and, and i said again you don't need to buy everything organic you can eat things that um you know where you don't but well, you don't eat the skins you can possibly get away with it and things like onions and potatoes where you're peeling stuff or bananas but where you're eating the fruit or veg that includes the skin like salad leaves or fruits or berries particularly are very absorbent then uh you're taking in those pesticides and they can be hormone disrupting as well and then the last one that's always really in, unpopular when I talk about it is the synthetic fragrances, the phthalates. Phthalates, it's really hard to say. It's <laughs> hard, harder to spell, P-H-T-A. Yeah. Phthalates, um, a massive group of chemicals that's usually found in synthetic fragrances, which us women absolutely love, don't we? We love our scented candles and our air fresheners and our cleaning products. And we like our clothes to smell nice and we like our perfumes and our body lotions and cosmetics and all of that stuff. Anything with a strong smell that, that might have parfum or fragrance in the ingredients is likely to be um, a part of this group of, of chemicals called phthalates. Very, very harmful and um, disrupting to hormones uh, potentially because of the nature. Again, they, they kind of act like estrogens. So um, things like that. So those are the kind of main three areas. There's plenty more, <laughs> but you can get, I don't, you know, it's hard not, to, you don't want to overwhelm people with, with this stuff because it can be kind of like, well, yeah. You know, I'm gonna walk around in a gas mask and <laughs> on me and um it's not like that but you know when we're aware of it we can then you know if something runs out we can then go out and see if there's something more natural around and there usually is there are so many more natural brands out there that don't use these harsh chemicals you know even with cleaning and laundry products now there's things like method who state on their website that they don't use phthalates in their products so things like that and i think that's just going to expand that whole area yeah. And then the last one is lifestyle. And by this, I mean um, movement and exercise. And often, actually, I'm sort of dispelling a few myths about exercise in that we should be pushing more and doing more and being more intense with it. Because actually, for women over 40, when they're going through perimenopause, and, and often their cortisol is raised, the, the last thing we want to be doing is, is pushing even more, um, especially when you're already tired and stressed. Because you you know you only have so much energy reserve um and i was speaking to somebody yesterday actually who said i'm absolutely exhausted every single day i can't i can hardly get through the day um but i but i'm not going to give up my running and i'm like, <laughs> I'm like going, wow okay how do you feel after your run she goes i'm literally dragging myself around wow. the park. and i'm like well okay um you're not going to like this but i'm going to have to tell you to stop 
because if that is really not doing you any good you haven't got the energy reserves to go running you know you can't get through your day so let's focus on getting that energy back so that you can then go back to running when you're ready but doing it now is not really helping you so and, and sometimes it's really hard to get that message through to a lot of people because we're just told the opposite aren't we? we're told mm. to do push and do more and um, sometimes it's just about pulling back and actually getting those energy reserves back working properly getting more back into balance and doing more gentle stuff for the time being like just walking and doing some yoga and pilates things like that so those are my four dis- big disruptors <laughs> No, I, I really like it. And I think it's great when we're able to, to structure it in that way. I think it makes it much more user friendly, understandable, and it gives us a great way to then act upon some of that information, you know, which out of those four categories do we feel that we want to start with perhaps, for example. Um, yeah, so yeah. Yeah. And I think yeah. what you mentioned with the stress, and how there are stresses that we may not be aware of, whether that's internal, such as a high toxin load, a high viral load, whatever it may be, but also, I guess, just this nature of, of busyness and you know, the mind or our, our mental state not having much of a rest because mm-hmm. we're constantly listening to <laughs> podcasts or whatever it may be. There's kind of a constant stimulus, I think, these days. And I definitely got to a point I think maybe last year where I was like, I need, I need a break. I need time away from stimuli. So if that's just cooking my dinner, my evening meal without a podcast on in the background or without whatever it is on in the background, Mm -hmm. just to give ourselves that little, that little break, a way to lighten the load as um, Tanya mentioned in the podcast earlier in the series, I think can be really powerful ways of just starting to chip away at some of these things. Yeah, do you know, um, you know, one of the questions I first uh, first ask women who come and see us is, you know, how do you switch off? Um, a lot of them say, well, hang on, no, first of all, I don't have time for that. What do you mean, switch off? <laughs> and then secondly, she goes, they, some of them say, yeah, well, I try. I try and re- sit and relax and do nothing. Um, and I either feel guilty because I'm not doing anything or I, or I get bored. So there's this thing about, well, first of all, there's huge guilt. I don't know. I, I, especially as a woman I think just when you're this whole thing about self-care I mean a, a lot of women can't seem to put themselves first because they're so used to looking after everyone else and they're the sort of the glue that makes everyone else function but I you know, say to them if you don't put yourself first you know and you burn out you're going to be no good to anyone in fact it could go the other way that you'll actually be a burden on other people which is the last thing you'll, you'll want to be so it, it's persuading women to kind of really give themselves time for themselves mm. and so stop feeling guilty for us for a start and then secondly what is this thing about we're, we're so surrounded by stuff to do and listen to and all of that that we can't we, we've forgotten how to even be bored haven't we and just not do anything mm. i mean i don't you are, you're not quite as old as me alex but you know my childhood obviously we didn't have any computers or whatever or internet or anything like that so you know we watched a bit of kids tv after school and then the rest of the day we you know didn't have anything to do so you kind of had to use your imagination make stuff up but we weren't constantly bombarded and i think you know obviously now we've got so much to do that we can't have those little spaces anymore where we actually feel like that there is nothing to do it's okay we can actually just sit and have nothing to do it's fine but yeah. i think we've lost that um ability in a way and i and i think that's when you know, the, the, we're always looking for the next thing. So that cortisol and adrenaline is just going on and on and on. And it's very hard to switch off when you're used to that because it's quite addictive. It is addictive. And what I was going to add to that is it's now so easy, not, as you say, not to be bored because of especially just social media. Turn your phone on and you can scroll endlessly. <laughs> um, and it's a real problem, I think. I was listening to, um, oh, I'm going to forget the name, but it was on the Rich Roll podcast and it was this idea of solitude, which the, the guest on the show defined as not having an external influence, i.e. you can have solitude in a busy coffee shop if you're just sat there absorbing your environment and looking and people watching. If you're not on your phone listening to music, etc., you were still in solitude, which I thought was an interesting way to define it because initially I had thought of it as you've got to be in the forest on your own. Yeah. But I like the idea that you can be in a busy coffee shop and as long as you're not getting some form of, I guess, personal stimulus 
um, you can experience solitude and that's very helpful and healthy and beneficial for the brain as well because as you say it's that time to switch off but mm -hmm. i agree i've i've seen so many people over the years who feel guilty with just sitting down for maybe half an hour in the middle of the day um and I, there's often obviously a an emotional a behavioral a belief issue there which needs to be worked on at the same time it's this idea that well i should be doing this and i should be doing that and i don't deserve this and i don't deserve that um and i think it, as you say also it becomes it does become habitual and it becomes addictive which we know, I mean, that's literally why they've changed certain things within social media. So we can endlessly uh, have that dopamine hit, I guess. They know what they're doing, don't they? <laughs> they definitely know what they're doing. Um, it's one area, actually, I have to admit, I really struggle with. I really do, because I I totally am addicted to my phone and I can't, I've really tried lots of different ways of trying to break that. It's really hard. I've been on holiday in July and um, I decided, you know, that I wasn't going to check my phone every day. And then I, I literally failed so miserably. My day <laughs> two, I was on it the whole time. And um, yeah, it's very, very strong. Mm. And, uh, you know, it really is doing, doing some damage, I think. So I, I'm, I'm still working progress on that one. Yeah, I think quite frankly, almost all of us are. <laughs> Um, and I certainly have a love-hate relationship with it because obviously it's, it's a great way of getting great information out there. It's a great business tool. It's great to serve the public and get information to them. Um, but it is addictive because I can see how my behavior changes and how my thought process change when I'm trying to use social media more to sort of, uh, I guess, push business stuff for the technical term. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a tricky one. Oh, we're telling people to, to, to calm down and switch off. And at the same time, we're feeding their addictions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah it's a hard one but it's, it is a hard one somehow don't you so mm. yeah i mean i, I sent uh, in a recent episode i think actually it may be still waiting to be released but we now have a technology bin outside the bedroom uh which has made a difference so you know as we walk into the bedroom phones whatever it may be get dumped in there we have an old school alarm clock now um Great, and do. it does help because I was even listening, there was a quick snippet on Instagram this morning I saw from Ben Greenfield and he, and he made the great point, which is, you know, unconsciously, if your phone is by your bedside table, um, there is going to be a mini sort of sympathetic nervous system stress awareness, just hypervigilance response of, I wonder what's going on in this little gadget of mine that's by my head. Um, <laughs> so it will influence things. So I think just the simplicity of having it in a different room I know James Clear talks about it in his book, um, Atomic Habits, this idea that if he just has his phone in a different room when he's working, he's like most of us, that lazy that he won't get up to go to a different room to check his Instagram, even though it's in just one different room. Um, so again, I think there are simple strategies that can at least manage to some degree these challenges that we all have. Oh, no, I agree. I agree. There's lots of strategies out there now. Um, it's just really finding the one that works for you, isn't it? And, uh, mm, and sticking yeah. to it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And as you said, I think early, you know, the idea of not overwhelming ourselves with so many different strategies at one time, you know, which out of the four categories that you mentioned, do you feel is having the potential biggest impact? And let's just start there initially. Yeah, the 80-20 rule, isn't it? Just go for the, the biggest impact one that, that that you know it's going to have 80 percent impact yeah mm. so um and often the case it's it's the stress one for most women because we we talk to a lot of women who say oh, i know what i'm eating i've got my diet sorted i've tried everything that on that side i'm taking some supplements that i think will help and usually they're you know pretty decent supplements not always the best but they're trying um and then it'll be that stress uh factor that they haven't really quite nailed you know so um we usually start there and you know with the testing that we do we can see you know how their adrenals are functioning whether their cortisol is too high too low or swinging about all over the place <laughs> and then we can we can actually you know that really helps because then they can see on paper we're not just saying to them you know stress is you're too stressed you've got to calm down because you know you can say that to your blue in the face but some people just won't take any notice of that um it's not until they see it on paper and the results are kind of all over the place mm -hmm. that they'll actually 
be compliant and start committing to change. So I've, I've found that really useful for the ones, especially the kind of the type A's who've been stressed forever, you know, and that they don't know any other life. Right. They've got to learn how to switch off. Um, and often it's, it's a test result that will actually make them do it because, you know, they can see that they're on their way to burnout or their, their, their cortisol is, is all over the place or even flatlined like mine was. Mm. Yeah. That is a really important point, I think. This idea that we, that we get so accustomed to whatever state we are in that we feel and view that as normal. You know, the idea that someone can be overwhelmingly stressed, you can kind of sometimes see the physical tension that they have. And that could manifest in how someone moves, for example, as well. Mm. But this idea that we just lose awareness because we're busy and we've been in that state of stress for so long. I know I've experienced that. And in one breathwork session I did, it kind of really hit me sort of in the face that, you know, I was carrying so much physical tension. Uh, and it was actually quite emotional to realize that there was all of this physical tension that I just hadn't been fully aware of at a conscious level that I'd been carrying around. And then you start to go, wow, <laughs> you know, well, I've just been, I've completely recalibrated my sense of what normal is ultimately. Uh, yeah. And I think yeah. the testing, as you say, can be so powerful there. Um, and also from a compliance perspective, sometimes um, it can really help, I think. Um, so I know you mentioned off air, Nikki, that you do sort of a lot of testing and actually sort of announcing our conversation on social media today. The questions that came up were around testing. So oh, do you want right. to, um, I guess, do you want to dive into that area of things and how, how you use it in clinic, what tests you use, what the benefits of them is and the kind of things that you see maybe? Yeah, absolutely. I love testing. I'm fascinated by the tests. We never get the same results back <laughs> because women are so different and they're so comprehensive that you know, we get so much information from them. So for hormones, we use the Dutch test, which is the dry urine test. It's, and the, the advantages of this one, I mean, we used to do blood and saliva <coughs> years ago, um, but this test, when this came, came along, it, it just blew everything out of the water, really. It was, it's such a comprehensive look at hormones, but not just the hormone levels, but how the hormones are behaving over a 24 hour period. And for us, you, you take four samples over 24 hours. Um, and what that shows is it looks at your adrenals as well, which is so useful. We've just been talking about that. But when you see your cortisol and your DHEA output over a 24 hour period, obviously we, we don't, they do a nice graph for you. And, um, you know, we have a, we have a, a certain pattern that, that the ordinary body follow that should follow, should we say in terms of cortisol production. And then you can measure yourself against that. And, like I said, you can be you know, very low, you can be high, you can be kind of the wrong way around. So we're producing too much in the, at night instead of in the morning, which is what's supposed to happen. Um, and I've seen every single which way possible <laughs> these results. And what it does in clinic is allows us to then really target your protocol. So for instance, if you've got a flatline cortisol, that'll be a different protocol to somebody with very high cortisol or bouncing around cortisol. So we can start, kind of really target that and also, this test is so good it shows you the metabolites of it so in the in the past where we've measured cortisol in saliva for instance we'd be looking at around three or four percent of your total saliva uh, cortisol production but with the urine and the metabolites we're looking at between 60 and 70 percent so it's much more accurate it's much more comprehensive and it means in clinic that we can really target the protocols um, and get results a lot quicker and that's the main reason we do the testing is to get quicker more effective results um, and less experimenting, if you like, because you know there's a lot of guesswork otherwise. Mm. Um, and the Dutch test also gives you obviously uh, sex hormones, so we're looking at all three estrogens, which you know many women don't even realise they produce three different ones. Because when you go to the doctors, they'll only really look at your estradiol, but the other two are really important as well. And the body can compensate sometimes when you're going through, you know, you hit forty and you start going through perimenopause, your estradiol starts to fluctuate and decline eventually um, but the body can compensate with the other two so we like to look at all three of them to see well okay what's going on what's the body doing um, and maybe you don't need estrogen replacement if your body's compensating with the other two um, which is something that the doctors wouldn't even consider so uh, the other main advantage of the estrogen testing is that we're looking at the metabolites so how is your estrogen being cleared through the body through the liver um, and it's really interesting for um, really looking at risks of future health because 
there are some you know, more risky pathways and there's more protective pathways that the, the liver can push your estrogen down. So we're wanting to obviously maximize the protective pathways. So we're helping women with, with their daily symptoms, but we're also looking at their future health and managing their risks as well. So that's why this test is so amazing. And of course, we're looking at progesterone and testosterone as well. So it does that yeah. a lot. And then there's the organic acid side of it now, obviously, as well. So we get some information, yes. some additional information. Um, yes, we get some key neurotransmitters like dopamine, uh, noradrenaline, melatonin as well. If somebody's not sleeping through the night or they're really troubling, to, finding it hard to get, get to sleep, then we can look at the melatonin levels. Um, B12 and B6 it shows as well. Um, glutathione as well, your master antioxidant. So some really, really interesting and useful markers in this test. That um, we, with you know, it's it's an all-round brilliant test. Yeah, yeah. I always have one client that stands out where who I did a Dutch test on, and it was actually a male who was on some testosterone replacement therapy, but right. still experiencing a lot of symptoms. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of aromatase activity, so he was doing a lot of conversion of his testosterone into estrogen, um, and that just hadn't been evaluated or assessed. So this sort of exogenous testosterone he was taking was essentially going down, as you say, the wrong pathway and almost sort of, so to speak, I guess, reinforcing the imbalance that was there. Um, mm -hmm. So it can be such a powerful test for us to consider. Um, I've, one of the questions on Instagram was sort of around, uh, I guess, if there are any situations where you might consider a different test or is Dutch kind of the real go-to? Are there any sort of exceptions to that rule? Um, it, well, only for thyroid really, because obviously we don't, we, we can't pick up your thyroid hormones on that. So we do blood tests for that. Okay. Um, but generally, no, I would say it's, it's pretty much the gold standard. I don't know of any other hormone test out there that, that I would use yeah. um, instead of it. No, I think, you know, it's still, it's still the, the number one for me. Yeah. And I guess Dutch now do the cycle tracking, don't they? So you can do the sort of 28 day or whatever it is. Um, yes. And that's, is that's, is that still urine? I've never done one of those. I believe it is. Yes. No, we, yeah. we don't tend to do those routinely, um, okay. but they can be really, really useful for people with, you know, cycle problems or mm. fertility issues and things like that. Um, but, you know, we're mostly dealing with perimenopause. So I want to see um, the other stuff, but, um, okay. but yeah, no, it, they, the, the range of tests they do are really, really interesting actually. And I, and I think they're a really good lab. Yeah. And do you do any other testing away from hormones to help you understand hormones <laughs> as it were? Oh, absolutely. So I'd say, you know, 60 to 70% of the women who come through our clinic are also have things like gut issues. Um, and you know, so, so gut, um, obviously has a big impact on your hormones. <coughs> it's where a lot of them are metabolized, converted, produced even. So, you know, your gut health has a big impact on how your hormones behave and then your hormones have an impact on your gut. There's this synergistic, um, behavior between them. Mm. And often, you know, uh, during when we've got hormone fluctuations, like through perimenopause, these, the, any kind of, um, susceptibility with gut problems tends to, to get exacerbated. So um many you, you know you can have more digestive issues as you go through this period as well so it's a bit of a kick <laughs> in the teeth when you're we're already having hormone problems so we do um anybody with kind of digestive like long-term ibs or any kind of bloating or digestive issues or even like things like brain fog and migraines because we know the direct link between the brain and the gut or excess fatigue or whatever we're, we're looking at the gut as well so um most of the time we'll do gut and hormones together and uh, for that, we use, uh, uh, well, actually, we've just recently changed to the, uh, we used a, a GI map before we're actually moving to in vivo's new test, the GI Ecologics, which is actually a very similar technology. It's basically looking for the DNA of your microbial balance. So we're looking for, you know, uh, bacteria, yeast, parasites, all that stuff. Um, but it's incredible the technology that, that you can use these days to pick these things up. Which, and it means that, you know, you only need a really small sample. It's really easy to collect. Um, a bit different from the old days and we had to do three days in a row those kind of tests do you remember those <laughs> yeah I was gonna say it's uh it's certainly more popular for the clients when they have to play with their poo once rather than three times <laughs> exactly. exactly yeah and the information we get is incredible you know we're looking at 
inflammatory markers, how you're digesting, your enzyme status, your immune system markers. We get a ton of information off, off these tests. And when we do them both together, you know, we've got a, a whole load of stuff that we can then work out, okay, well, what's impacting what? Which is the priority that we need to get to? What's the biggest area that we'll get the biggest impact from? And that's when you can really um, target, target the results, yeah. And alongside that, we also do blood tests because really that's the, the only way to really accurately reflect thyroid levels, which we're very, you know, very keen on seeing because when you get your thyroid tested, it's very generally only the TSH and T4 you get, which does not show your full thyroid pathway. So we really want to see your active thyroid hormone and your antibodies to make sure that everything's working and as it should. Um, and, you know, for women over 40, that's really, really important because your thyroid does tend to um, struggle after 40, not only because of the stress levels, because cortisol has a direct imp impact on your thyroid, but you know, genetically it's more prevalent in women. Um, and your thyroid does you know, struggle a bit as you get older. So uh, we want to make sure it's optimal because your thyroid can, you know, affects everything. So we can get thyroid symptoms that are mimicking like menopause symptoms. So sometimes it's just the thyroid. So if we can get that sorted out, then, uh, then everything improves. So um yeah that's one to look at and we're also looking at nutrient deficiencies because again massively uh, common uh deficiencies as we get older i'm looking at you know vitamin d which we're all deficient in through the winter if we're not supplementing especially in this country um uh, iron if you've still got a cycle as well it's really important to make sure your iron levels are good folate we know massive impact on the body um b12 which we test in the blood for the active version of b12 which is much more reliable than a blood test you might get at the doctors um and the last one we look at is magnesium because you know us women we tend to be very deficient well men as well but um it's a key key nutrient that we tend to be deficient in because we're just not eating enough magnesium rich foods which are the dark green leafy veg <laughs> surprise surprise yeah and it's and the stress as well it, de it depletes quite rapidly and we're all stressed so no surprise we're not eating enough dark green leafy veg and we're all stressed so we're pretty much all magnesium deficient so. mm, double That's whammy it. yeah yeah and then i guess you know if you look at some of the literature that are depending on where you're getting your food from the soils are becoming depleted so we have mm -hmm. a, a triple whammy um, yeah. But that's interesting. So I was going to I was going to ask if how much sort of nutrient testing you do, because I guess that's, a, again, just a, a foundational element to healthy, happy hormones. Yeah, absolutely. So those five we ran, we routinely test. Um, sometimes we'll add on, you know, an omega three, six ratio just to look at the fats. But actually, we've kind of stopped doing that because every single test result came back deficient in omega three. So we kind of just assume that everyone's going to be needing some omega-3s so mm. we, we thought actually and it's and it, it is quite an expensive test to add on so um rather than just get the same results all the time we just prescribe omega-3 anyway because we know how beneficial that is so, right um, especially for women in hormones yeah yeah um, it is fascinating i was um i was doing some research yesterday on so the microbiota, pro and prebiotics and skeletal health and osteoporosis and things like this, which obviously wow. I imagine you see a reasonable amount clinically as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's amazing to see what's, what's out there. I mean, there's a lot more animal based research at the moment that there is some human research and it's just fascinating to think that there is a connection between these little bacterial guys and girls within our guts and what's going on from a skeletal perspective as well as everything else that you've mentioned such as hormonally and immunologically etc i'm not surprised though because you know every time there's research done it always comes back to they have an impact on everything don't they absolutely <laughs> yeah. everything it's like what what do they not have an impact on seriously yeah <laughs> it's it so important amazing. to have that balance now, isn't it because mm. And you know that diversity as well that I think we've lost as well that the diversity because we tend to kind of eat, go for the same foods all the time and eat the same vegetables and we've got to feed those good bacteria and it's it's that diversity that they really need. And yeah, then, and I'm really pushing with you when you're tired, when you're you know stressed, tired, and haven't got any time. You know, to right. make sure that you're getting all those different veg. Yeah, there is unfortunately, I guess, a sort of society cultural issue that we have as well around almost pride in being busy 
and achieving. And it comes back to this idea of, as a result, feeling guilty for having a lunch break. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's worrying. It's like, a, yeah, it's a, it's a badge of honour, isn't it? If you have to work through lunch. Oh, you're so busy. You must be so important. Yeah. And I always joke because, I mean, I, even in my 20s, looking back, there are times when I would say that I was busy and I wasn't. It was just because I felt... I felt almost ashamed of being like, no, I'm not busy and, I'm, and I love it. <laughs> yeah, and because it's, it's linked up with worth in society. Yeah. If you're not busy, well, what, what are you providing to society? Who, you right. know, what are you doing? And um, I think that it's a really hard one to shift that. A, mm. a, a paradigm that doesn't suit us anymore and doesn't keep us healthy, but it's going to be a tough one to shift. Yes, definitely. Um, and going back, I guess, to the microbial diversity, I think, I think a big thing for me is also more um, environmental. So the idea of so many of us living in urban environments compared to rural environments, the air that we breathe being of poor quality with a high toxic load, so to speak. And I, I really feel that that's having a significant impact on what we're seeing microbially within us as well. Um, mm -hmm. So there's stressing the food diversity. And then I think there's stressing the environmental diversity of just trying to get out into the parks and rolling around in the muds and taking a swim in the lake um, when possible and when convenient as a, as a way to kind of help us from this immunological perspective as well. Yeah. And I think we're all just working too hard and we haven't got yeah. the energy to even, try, to even think about anything like that. It's just not, it, not in our headspace. Mm. So, um, but, you know, I always encourage women particularly to, to just take 10, 15 minutes a day for themselves, whatever that is for them. It doesn't, they don't have to sit cross-legged and meditate. They can um, go and have a warm bath and that, you know, that itself with some Epsom salts or something for some magnesium yeah. can just, you know, switch them off, give them some time to just sit in a bath and do nothing. They don't have to do anything. Um, or go and read for 20 minutes. We've, we've, I've seen studies that show reading on, alone can bring down cortisol. So... <laughs> Uh, really amazing just just you know women say oh I haven't got time you know, I feel guilty sitting reading a book I'm not on holiday mm -hmm. <laughs> like, well okay just do it for 10-15 minutes that's not too bad is it you know you can't you can't feel too guilty about that yeah uh, but, but also going out for walks I mean it's so important to get out there in nature and it's got so many benefits to it it's not just the exercise and the movement is it it's being around those that the nature and, the, and all of that could, that can do for you and, and I know you know, it sounds obvious because obviously you go out for a walk, come back, you feel better, don't you? But it's just getting it into that habitual thing where you do it every day. And that's the hard thing for people to do. I think it's just, you know, a lot of women say to me, well, I go on a spa break every few months. I'm like, I'm not really going to cut it. <laughs> right. Yeah, I kind of, I sometimes talk about the idea of um, the higher our stress levels, the lower the relaxation needs to be. So this idea that if you have a high stress job or a high stress life, you can't then view zoning out on the couch for an hour or two in the evening appropriate to modulate that stress response. Mm -hmm. So you need the Epsom salt bath or you need the, to get lost in the novel or you need some time in nature, etc., to mm -hmm. have an appropriate, I will call it like sort of yin yang balance as it were. Mm -hmm. um, because I think often we do, we kind of, we're zoning out and we're escaping, but we're not actually re-nourishing, recharging. And when we think about high, how high our stress levels are, um, and I feel there's often that mismatch there. Yeah, um, binge watching on Netflix doesn't quite do it, does it? <laughs> yeah, especially when it's you know some some Something thriller. thriller. <laughs> like, yeah. Doesn't quite yeah. work. You're just no. getting a different kind of stress. Absolutely. Um, and a message that I have found sometimes works with clients and certainly works with myself sometimes when I'm struggling is, you know, what is the message I am sending myself by this behavior? So if it is like a five, 10 minute reading the novel, just as a way to kind of start this process, it's like, okay, what is the message I'm sending myself by doing this micro moment of, of relaxation? Well, it's that I'm worthy of it that I deserve it, that I can do it. And it just starts to build and shift that perspective of what's possible and, and what we are capable and able and worthy of. of. 
I love that. And then, you know, maybe you could increase that a little bit when you've, you've, you've got your worthiness yeah. up and then you just can add a few minutes every day to that and you might make it to half an hour. Or... Yeah. yeah. Because it's, no, the, it's the sort of, it's the routine, I think, that matters the most. I'm pretty sure, again, James Clear talks about it in his book, Atomic Habits, this idea that, you know, sometimes if we use exercise as the example, it's just showing up at the gym. Don't even have expectations about what you do. Just get there. Have that routine of getting there. It could be that you just stretch for the first week and then you might get one morning you rock up and you go, okay, I'm going to hop on the treadmill and have a five minute walk. And it, and it does just sort of escalate um, because it's that repetition. And again, sending that message and rewriting the narrative of what you're capable of, et cetera. Um, I think it was his book actually that there's a lot, there's a thing he, a tool he uses that I think it was him, but I wasn't sure, but it's, he says, um, don't think about the whole task or the whole thing. Just do the one, the first thing. So, yes. you, so you'd say to yourself, well, I've got a letter, um, you know, I've got an assignment to write or I've got a blog to write. Just, shall I just write the title? Can I just write the first line? And then see what happens after that. But if you just yeah. give yourself that, can I just, you know, put my trainers on? Can I just make it to the, to the first bit of the gym or whatever? And then don't put any expectation on yourself after that. And then obviously that momentum starts to build because it's always that first thing isn't it looking at a blank sheet of paper or yeah imagining getting up and going to the gym is just it's just sometimes it's just too overwhelming mm. no definitely and I think especially when you've you know using the gym as an example you've been a gym goer in the past you know you're not going to be as strong or as fit as you were so you've got this comparison in your head of well I'm not going to go at all then <laughs> um, and it's rather than that saying okay well let's just go and play around you know pick up some light weights have a bit of fun and yeah. start yeah. Uh, and then by doing that that's the only way we're ever going to get back to being as strong or as fit or whatever it may be that we once were uh, yeah. and I know that because that's my narrative that I have right, I know you're talking about, yeah. <laughs> it's like well if I can't lift what I did three months ago what's the point <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah it is it's just turn up you know drop the yeah. ego lift up just that one that kilogram first, dumbbell yeah. <laughs> that first little move that's it that's all it is yeah yeah, yeah. Definitely. Um, and it's just, a, it's a positive snowball. Yes. Positive. Um, That's a bit of momentum. Yeah, definitely. Mm. Um, and I saw a quote recently that I, is kind of related to, I guess, what we're talking about, which was along the lines of, you know, why are you taking it so seriously? Like seriousness is almost a symptom in its own right. And I think I can be guilty of this in my, in my own work slash health which is taking it too seriously not having enough sort of play and fun within this and i was speaking to jill a colleague on the last episode of the podcast that is that is actually out and she was saying one of the things she's seeing in clinic and she's sort of a life and performance coach is people using things like fitbits and step counters but using it almost as a way to, I'm going to say this wrong, as a way to punish themselves when they don't achieve their goals. So if they only hit 5,000 steps and they've gone for 10,000, they're now sort of, there's a, a narrative which is, I'm useless, I haven't done it. And then that leads into emotional binge eating. And actually it's just fueling, I guess, an unhealthy relationship with themselves. And one of the things that really sort of came up for me in that conversation which i asked jill about was it it feels that sometimes these tools may may enhance and magnify an unhealthy relationship if we have one with ourselves you know mm. if we're being mean to ourselves in some way and then we're setting ourselves goal with that we're not hitting and then it's giving us another reason to be or another excuse to kind of beat ourselves up about it yeah. uh, it can feed into really the underlying issue that might be the thing that needs most attention, if that makes sense. Oh, totally, totally. You know, I, I totally get that. And, you know, that's why I never bought a Fitbit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to be reminded that I haven't done something. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Yeah. And I think it is, it really does come back. All these things are relationships. Um, I had a Fitbit four years ago, I think around that. And I loved it, but, one of the things that I would do, and it was in the summer months, which made it obviously an awful lot easier, but I would go out for a 2000 step walk if I was at 8,000 steps to get to my 10,000 steps. Cause I also had clients that could see my activity. So there was the sort of, oh, 
the healthy peer pressure that I'll <laughs> call it. But it, I, it really did help me do things that I wouldn't necessarily have done without it. But it doesn't you mean have to be that, of it, that mindset that it's going exactly, to be exactly. Yeah, right it doesn't it. mean that it's the right thing for yeah. everyone. And I think we need to be mindful of how we use it. Is it kind of controlling us in a positive or a negative way? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I thought that was really interesting. It's the same with food, whether you're obsessing over it or not and taking yeah. it too seriously. Um, you know, we're all about the 80-20 rule and just, you know, having a little bit of good uh, stuff that you enjoy and not, not stressing about it. Because if you're going to have that cake, then eat it and don't feel guilty about it because that's just going right. to make everything worse. <laughs> yeah. And I think that 80-20 rule is so important because um, it's something I've been saying to clients recently. And I actually, again, saw a quote this morning. I feel like I'm on social media all the time. It was on Instagram. Um, but it was from Paul Check, And it was basically along the lines of, you know, rigidity in our thinking is going to contribute to rigidity in our physiology. Um, so if you have these black and white rules around, I should do this or I can't do that with your diet or with your supplements or with your lifestyle or anything, you, we are creating rigidity, I think, in our physiology. And that's the exact opposite of what health is. Healthy physiology is flexible, adaptable physiology. And we need that in our thinking and thought processes as well. Yeah. And, you know, we, there's this whole, you know, attitude of oh this food is bad this food is good and if we can get away from that and just say well no we just need to promote nutrients if we can get those nutrients in yeah you can have a little bit of something that is bad in inverted commas it's not bad is it it's just mm. less nutritious than than the other choice right. and it, we can it, we can't demonize stuff because then you're just going to feel deprived and then hungry and your self-worth is going to be affected as well so yeah, eighty twenty rule definitely, <laughs> and it helps me too because you know I like, my yeah. I like my red wine and my chocolate and my coffee. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> get it into my twenty percent and I'm happy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's Dr. Alex Vasquez who talks about the eighty twenty rule, so he can have his chocolate and coffee. <laughs> exactly. We've just made it up, so it suits us. <laughs> but life's not fun with coffee and chocolate and wine in it. Sorry, it just is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We. Uh, and that's the thing, you know, it goes back to this idea that foods is more than just nourishment. It is cultural, it is social, it is spiritual, it is all sorts of things. Yeah, yeah. And wh wh why do you want to lose that? You, you know, we, we can be, get so obsessed with, with that that it takes all the fun out of just having a, a, a normal life and normal, normal, fitting into society and making sure that we're not, you know, we're not too freaky about it. Yeah. <laughs> definitely the hard balance though yeah no it, it is i think um it's getting that balance i guess of of doing what you need to do to improve maintain optimize your health if that is your goal um and if it's possible um while not isolating ourselves from our current friendship group i don't think it has to be kind of one or the other um and i think if we're viewing it from that way then we may need to be gently challenged on some of that belief system as well yeah but also not making everything more of a stress than everything already yeah. is you've got enough stresses in our lives and then we start <laughs> stressing about food and and all the other things that we're doing then you know that just makes it all worse yeah take some yeah. of the stress off definitely <laughs> i like chris cress's statement of you know there's more to health than nutrition and there's more to nutrition than health uh, yeah. i think it put, puts it well like it yeah he's great i i i um I might nick some of his sayings as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he's a he is a good guy. So, Nikki, is there um is there anything that we haven't mentioned that you would really like to share with our listeners? If not, is there anything that you would like to, I guess, sort of conclude or re-emphasize? Um, well, we haven't touched on um, kind of the menopause treatments or HRT or anything or natural alternatives to that. Um, do you want to explore that a little bit? Yeah, I think people would love to, to hear that. Um, because, you know, we get um, some really good results with just using, you know, phytoestrogens, plant estrogens. Um, I think there's a lot of confusion over this because um, there's, there's black, it's, it's not black or white, the, the research. Um, but at, in clinic, we found some really helpful um, 
supplements and and foods that that can help to just really rebalance that estrogen and progesterone so um, things like uh, soy and I know that can be very controversial but we've found that organic soy not um, processed or you know uh, denatured or whatever but organic soy milk unsweetened organic soy yogurt um, bit a little organic tofu or edamame beans things like that can really really help to support your estrogen because it the, the, the plant estrogens they're very very weak obviously they're not as strong as your own estrogen but they can latch onto the those receptors and really just give your body a, a little bit of a helping hand even if you're if you've got too much they can latch on and prevent your own estrogen from from acting so it's good if you've got lots too much estrogen but also it can do the opposite and it can latch on and, and act like a weak estrogen as well so we're we're finding in um, clinic that 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 foods those kind of foods, especially um, soy and flax seeds, are another big source of, of phytoestrogens, can be really helpful. And you know, they're quite easy to fit into your diet. Um, and uh, especially flax seeds, I mean, you can mill them, you can you can throw them on everything. They can put, you can put them in the smoothies. You can make uh, tofu scrambles. You can have soy milk instead of dairy. Things like that. Those little things really can help. Um, if you're not intolerant to soy, obviously it's uh, it's one that if you do have any digestive issues, you want to avoid. Um, and then the other side of things, supplements, things like um, we found really helpful are things like red clover extracts, which have a high degree of isoflavones from the which which are the uh, uh, polyphenols found in um, in soy and um, phytoestrogens, but it, they're in an extract form, so that can be really helpful as too. And we we use maca quite a bit as well, maca extract. Okay um all these i mean does that one thing doesn't work on every woman that's the thing you have to kind of experiment a little bit because they have varying degrees of effects depending on what your body is is like and your history etc so um it is worth trialing some of these things but um if they none of those things are working for you then you know hrt is an option and i get a lot of questions about what you know is it safe what kind of things should i be looking for and we, i just um i don't understand but uh, so many women don't realize that body identical HRT, natural, molecularly identical to your own hormones, is available on the NHS. You don't have to go to an expensive private doctor in Harley Street. You can ask your doctor for estrogen only patch or gel, completely body identical. And the only natural progesterone available on the NHS is something called Eutrogestam, which is a pill. Um, that formulation is body identical, which means that it's... Um, pretty natural it's, it's exactly the same as your own hormone production you obviously want to be careful and you know get tested before you take any kind of H hrt just in case you don't really need it but um if you do need it it can be really really effective um but but make sure you're you're not on the synthetic form because that's the one with all the side effects and the risks and the one you can't really take long term either so um but yeah be informed ask your doctor sometimes your doctors need a bit of pushing but <laughs> they are you know they 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 were obviously they're wanting to help and a lot of gps don't know a lot about the hormones um because they're not specialists but um if you go in informed and you know what you're asking for then you know they're, they're quite happy sometimes that you've done your own research to be honest because it saves them a bit of time right <laughs> yeah and i, I that was no that's really helpful thank you nikki and i don't watch the news but it was on in the gym this morning and i'm sure there was a conversation going on about a real shortage of yes. hrt at the moment is that right yeah yeah there are some a lot of shortages um and I, i'm not sure of the latest situation on all the different brands but um if there is a shortage i usually tell women to ask ask for a different form so whether you're if you're on the patch and then you can't get hold of that then go on to the gel um again right. there's an, there's options there for for um and I don't think there's any problem with the progesterone in terms of supply, okay. but um, yeah, there are different brands, but you know, it's confusing because there's also a combined patch with synthetic progestins in it, which you don't really want. Um, so it's important to, to ask for the estrogen only versions. And there's a few brands that you could have. So hopefully you'll find one that's in stock or switch to the gel. Yeah. And what are some of the most common risks of the synthetic HRT? Well, the studies seem to show that the studies that they've done, you know, when you get the big headlines, you know, HRT causes cancer, all that stuff that we've seen in the, in the press, um, all of those studies have been done on the synthetic forms of HRT, of the estrogen and progestins. Um, they haven't been done on the body identicals. So as far as we know, they are safer. 
um, but I still don't think they've done enough research on the on the body identicals yet. But um, the risks are you know, increased risk of breast cancer, um, DVT, thrombosis, thrombosis, stroke, that kind of thing. Um, again, the risks aren't don't seem to be like hugely significant, but there are they are there. So, um, and then it, you know it's up to, to I I just know that you know, most women I want to have informed choice so that they can make their own choices for themselves. Yeah. And you know if you've got breast cancer in the family or extra risk of DVT or something like that, then obviously you'll be worried about that. So to know that there's an alternative on the market and not just have to suffer because there's nothing else out there um, is useful. And you can ask your doctor about that. Mm, perfect. Excellent. Thank you very much. That has been brilliant. You're um, welcome. Is there anything else that you think is important for us to just touch on? Um, just from, from my side of things and my experience is just to not suffer alone. <laughs> there is enormous amounts of help out there, even if it's just a support network that you want to talk about your problems or your issues. Um, but there are so many practitioners out there that can help. Um, look for someone who obviously has got experience in this area um, and, and don't suffer alone. There's no need to do that. You know, our grandparents, our grandmothers all suffered alone. There was no, nothing for them back then. Um, they either suffered or they had a hysterectomy and got everything taken out. That was pretty much their, their only options. So these days there are many, many more options and uh, just get, get the help you need and don't, don't, put up with, um, don't put up with your symptoms or being fobbed off by anyone because that's not, it's not needed. Brilliant. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much, Nikki. If people would like to um, sort of check you out, follow you, uh, contact you, what are some of the best ways to find you online uh if you just go to happyhormonesforlife.com you will find all my social media platforms on there and um lots of resources loads of free stuff just launched my own podcast um got tons of blogs on there over 150 blogs i think at the moment so if you search for whatever you're looking for you'll probably find it on there <laughs> um and there's lots of resources there excellent all righty well thank you very much nikki it's been great to chat um, and I'm sure we'll speak again soon. Thanks for having me.